Hello and welcome. Today's video shall be the result of a long journey. Initially I held this main board in my hands with this strange extended PCI slot and thought that this could be an interesting setup. Some kind of DOS machine, maybe with a 3DFX voodoo. Unfortunately this board officially supported only non-MMX CPUs up to Intel Pentium 166 and that sounded kind of boring. The interesting thing about it was that it had a huge potential and with some modifications and custom voltage regulator it could be much more powerful. How powerful? This is what I want to talk about today. If you missed the whole story about the mainboard modifications and the voltage regulator, feel free to watch the previous parts and today it is all about testing and answering some interesting questions which I was curious about for a long time. First of all, there is one thing which is left to be fixed. In the last part I showed you how an AMD K6 2400MHz ran in this board with front side bars at 66MHz and multiplier 6. This is the fastest effective clock which is possible on this board without further hardware modifications. The only way to get more out of it is to replace the clock generator and increase the front side bus, but I'm not keen to do that since it would end up with overclocked PCI bus and probably unstable system. Running with front side bus at 66 MHz, it is still in specs and rock solid, just as I want it to be, so with highest possible multiplier of 6, the absolute maximal effective CPU clock is at 400 MHz. I also can't select anything between multiplier 3.5 and 6 for reasons which I explained in the second part of this series. So we can only use CPUs up to 233 MHz or 400 MHz and nothing in between. The problem is that the original BIOS was created long before AMD K6 II was introduced. So it falsely detects the K6-2400 as K6-300 and in the information table it shows 375 MHz, which is of course totally wrong. However, in the CPU identification utility, the CPU is shown properly as K6-2400. So the BIOS has to be fixed and if you watch my channel regularly, Maybe you remember the BIOS patcher tool which I presented some time ago. This tool can add missing bits to the BIOS to fix some issues and also to properly detect the CPUs. However, this is an ASUS mainboard and the um, word biases were, well, heavily modified. So much modified that the BIOS patcher struggles to fix it properly. As I used it on this BIOS, this, the CPU was detected as an AMD K6-2 but it was still showing as 300MHz version. Still not perfect. Luckily, I was contacted by Jan Stoinebrink from Netherlands. I hope I pronounced the name properly and uh, he offered me a modded BIOS for this ASUS mainboard. Some of you will know Jan at least from his wonderful tool CPU Identification Utility, which is included in Fields Computer Lab DOS Benchmark Pack. By the way, Jan pointed out that there is a newer version of his tool as the one from Phil's pack. Jan has improved CPU detection and delivers more information where possible. You can find the links in the description. I would also like to thank Jan once again not only for his contribution to the retro hardware community, but in particular for the modded BIOS. With that, the mainboard probably detected the CPU as AMD K6-2400. Also in the overview table the CPU was properly listed as K6-2 at 400MHz. There was one strange thing however. The original BIOS seemed to deliver higher memory and lower level 1 cache throughput. I could not only see it in SpeedSea's tests but also in other benchmarks. For example Doom was running slightly faster on the original BIOS. Therefore Quake and PC Player benchmark were faster on the modded BIOS. Luckily Jan could again help with this and said that in the modded BIOS so-called write allocation is activated for the first 128 MB of RAM, which ends up in such results. I will not go into details in this video, but in the original BIOS this hasn't been activated and ended up in the mentioned results. Jan pointed out that there is a tool named K6 uh, WA ON, which stands for write allocation ON, which can be used to control the write allocation, and I could validate that it was indeed the reason. 
I uploaded the Yansmoded BIOS to the RetroWeb project, so if you are interested you can download it there, or on Jan's personal page, where he has a huge list of modded BIOSes for other mainboards too. The link is also in the description. Eventually I ended up using Jan's BIOS for all subsequent benchmarks with write allocation enabled, same BIOS settings and memory timings, so the results are all consistent. For testing I used this Hercules Stingray Pro graphics card, which is one of the fastest PCI graphics cards for DOS which I have. Unfortunately my capture adapter didn't like this card and produced some diagonal uh, stripes. Those stripes were not visible on the monitor and occurred only during the capture. The last part ended with working AMD K6 to 400 in this mainboard, but during my tests I went step for step and tried to answer as many interesting questions as possible. So I started with the CPU, which was officially supported by this mainboard on the day of its release, Pentium 166 non-MMX. I made a lot of benchmarks, but decided to reduce the amount to three most widely used results. They give a good representation and overview of relative performance, and I'm going to talk a lot about relative performance today. So, with Intel Pentium 166 I got 76 FPS in Doom, 12.9 FPS in PC Player Benchmark, and 33.4 FPS in Quake. By the way, all Quake results are in VGA 320x200. I didn't compare these results with somebody else's, but I think they are more or less normal. But it is interesting what we would get with better CPUs, and the first upgrade would be Intel Pentium 200, again non-MMX. Here a big thank you to Robert, who borrowed me this CPU for testing. At the time of release of this mainboard, end of 1995, the CPU wasn't yet released officially, but it was fully compatible though. With the Pentium 200 I got 81 FPS in Doom, 13.6 FPS in PC Player Benchmark and 35.9 FPS in Quake. That is an average increase of about 6%. Not much, so it was not really worth it to upgrade a CPU from 166MHz to 200MHz. And now the interesting part starts. Since we have a voltage regulator module, we can upgrade this mainboard to various dual voltage CPUs. Let's go with 166 and 200MHz, but this time Intel Pentium MMX CPUs. The 166 MMX delivers 81 FPS in Doom, 13.9 FPS in PC Player Benchmark and 37.2 FPS in Quake. The 200 MHz performs with 86 FPS in Doom, 14.7 FPS in PC Player Benchmark and breaks through 40 FPS mark on Quake. Here we already see something very interesting. The 166 MMX runs faster than a non-MMX Pentium at 200 MHz. What's the magic? Is it MMX? Well, actually no. None of those uh, benchmarks make use of MMX instructions. But why does it run faster? Intel introduced MMX as a shiny feature, which should make everything faster and define the future of their CPUs. And MMX offered a great improvement indeed, but only in software which was compiled with optimization for MMX. And this was an issue since most of the software and games at the point of MMX introduction were of course made without that. You couldn't make software which wasn't developed for MMX explicitly run faster just by running it on a CPU which supports MMX instructions, so theoretically for example Doom should run on a 166 non-MMX Pentiums just as fast as on the 166 MMX versions. But this would be a problem for Intel, which of course wanted to push its MMX feature and presented it as the thing which makes everything better. The MMX CPUs had to be faster compared clock for clock to the non-MMX predecessors. The secret of a faster MMX CPUs compared to a non-MMX version was mainly in the level 1 cache, which was with 32K twice as large on the MMX CPUs. There were also some other minor improvements, but they all were not MMX related, although Intel was trying to make it look like that. Hands down, MMX CPUs were faster indeed, and I could confirm that in my tests. 
At the same clock, the MMX versions of the CPUs were about 8 to 10% faster in average. And those numbers are interesting, since uh, here we can definitely see that Pentium 200 is slightly slower than a Pentium 166 MMX. That was the time where it started to be clear that higher clock doesn't mean faster CPU. This trend uh, we saw in the past years many times and it is still absolutely valid. This was a benchmark which I wanted to make already many times and since I have an AMD K6233 in my collection I decided to compare this one as well. The VRM module delivered 3.2 volts core voltage flawlessly and I got 86 FPS in Doom, 18.3 FPS in PC player benchmark and 35.8 FPS in Quake. Those are also very interesting results. I was not expecting that the 33 MHz higher clocked AMD K6 would run at the same frame rate in Doom as Pentium 200 MMX, but we can clearly see how much better the AMD K6 performs in PC player benchmark. No wonder, in integer calculations AMD K6 usually delivered much better performance than the Intel CPUs and PC player benchmark used mostly integers in the calculations. However, Intel had a much better FPU and games with floating point calculations ran a lot faster on Intel Pentium compared to AMD K6. Quake was such a game and we see that Pentium 200 MMX is about 10% faster than the higher clocked AMD K6 in this game. And finally it is time to get serious and take a look at the AMD K6 400. Also here, the VRM delivered outstanding performance. I made a lot of benchmarks and played many different games over multiple hours. The system ran rock solid. I didn't experience a single crash or instability and the VRM remained barely warm all this time. It was a very nice test run. The numbers which I got here, 89 FPS in Doom, 22.8 FPS in PC player benchmark and 45.7 FPS in Quake. In Doom it looks like the system hit some bottleneck and the numbers are barely changed compared to Pentium 200 MMX. However, PC player benchmark gained about 50% performance and thankfully to obviously higher clock even though AMD's FPU is weaker, in Quake we also got about 12% higher FPS. Also here we see that linear clock increase doesn't mean linear performance improvement. We seem more and more to hit limitations of the Socket 7 platform with its low memory and cache throughput. Well, we seem to, but this is by far not the end. There is much more potential hidden in this system. It is possible to significantly raise the level 2 cache performance. As you see, originally this board was equipped with so-called asynchronous cache A32K of 15 nanoseconds deep SRAM ICs. 256 kilobytes in total, just as they've been used since 3 to 6 DX times. The Intel 430FX chipset introduced an improved type of level 2 cache named Pipeline Burst Cache, which significantly reduced weight states during the cache access and improved performance of sequential memory access. This type of cache uh, was however more expensive and many manufacturers delivered their boards with the uh, all type of the cache. Luckily, most of them provided a slot for so-called COAST module, which stands for cache on stick. I knew that pipeline burst cache is faster than the older asynchronous cache from back in the days, but I never tested it myself, and this project was a good opportunity to fill the gap. Speaking of gap filling, I had something in my spare parts which should be 256 kilobytes of synchronous pipeline burst cache module, so I gave it a try. To use it on this mainboard there is no need to remove the deep um, SRAM ICs. It is enough just to move a jumper and insert the coast module. The board detected the cache as pipeline burst indeed, but unfortunately it was reported to be 512k, which is not true. The system hung either during memory initialization or HiMem reported uh, various errors. The size of cache is encoded in the pins of the cost module. Some are pulled up or down to notify to the mainboard the actual size. I tested the pins and they seem to be fine. I also tried to remove the deep SRM ICs just to ensure that they didn't interfere somehow the, with the cost module. But neither that nor playing around with jumpers did bring any improvement. 
Maybe the module is defective or just incompatible with this ASUS mainboard. Luckily, a long-time viewer of my channel, Stibor, who already made a couple of generous donations, helped me out and organized a Pipeline Burst Coast module, which is compatible with this ASUS mainboard. The module comes obviously from an IBM machine, but it is indeed fully compatible with the setup which I have. As soon as I inserted it into the slot, the system booted properly, reported 256k of pipeline burst cache and ran absolutely stable. A big thank you to Stibor at this point for helping out. So I repeated all the tests with the pipeline burst cache once again and the results were very impressive. The non-MMX Pentium 166 with pipeline burst cache was just as fast as Pentium MMX at 200 MHz with asynchronous cache. In PC Player Benchmark it was even faster. So back in the days upgrading to pipeline burst cache made even more sense than a CPU upgrade. I honestly didn't expect such a big difference. Due to smaller level 1 cache, older non-MMX Intel CPUs benefited even more from the faster level 2 cache than the newer versions and put up to 20% of performance increase onto the scale. All in all, the results are not bad. With an AMD K6 400 and Pipeline Burst Cache, we could increase the performance of this system already in average by 70%. In Doom, the increase is not quite as high, but in Quake, we got it from 33 to 54 FPS. Not bad. But can we somehow get it over 60 FPS? Well, in the last part I promised an exciting surprise and I hope it will give us some extra power. Recently I bought a pile of scrap on eBay, really only to get some parts from it for my projects. Nothing exciting, just some crashed PCBs, cables, connectors, etc. I paid only a couple of euros and didn't even look into the box uh, as I got it. First, as I needed some ICs and hoped to find them there, I opened the box and found this. It was squeezed between the PCBs with bent pins begging for help. An AMD K63 Plus 500. What a surprise. Of course, it was not in this box, I just used it for storage, but I only had to straighten the pins, otherwise the CPU was totally working. My VRM worked absolutely reliably as well, and I could even underclock the CPU to 1.6 volts. Also, Jan's modded BIOS detected the CPU perfectly fine and the best is that the onboard level 2 cache worked even as level 3 cache, which I could confirm in the tests. I repeated all the tests again with asynchronous and with pipeline burst cache configurations and in Doom I got 115 respective uh, 120 FPS, in PC player benchmark 31.9 and 36.4 FPS and in Quake 58.7 and Infernal 66.6 FPS. Remember, this board officially supported only non-MMX Pentium 166 in the year 1995 and though it runs perfectly fine now with the CPU from the year 2000, twice as fast as before. I would consider this project as a total success. What do you think? In this series, not only did we upgrade a mainboard far beyond its limits, we also could answer many interesting questions. Like how much difference was there between MMX and non-MMX CPUs when using software without MMX optimization? How much difference there was between asynchronous and pipeline burst cache? How good K6 performed against similar Pentium CPUs and what K6 II and K6 III Plus could reach in such systems? I think this is the first 430FX mainboard which runs an AMD K6 3 Plus, but I hope it will be not the last one, so I'm curious about your results. With the VRM available now, it is time to dig out some old mainboards and test their limits. I will definitely continue to work on this project, test more mainboards and CPUs. I also would like to compare a real SuperSocket 7 mainboard to the numbers which I presented today, so subscribe not to miss it in the future. And this is it for today, if you enjoyed this project please leave your feedback below and so far thank you for watching and goodbye.